Uh, welcome back to uh, Basic Science Lights the Way. As Susan mentioned, I'm Steve Kahn. I'm the Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. And we're extremely grateful to your audience for continuing to tune in as we share the latest groundbreaking science uh, here at UC Berkeley. Um, uh, normally, we cover research topics, but tonight we're going to talk about the science of teaching. Um, we are, of course, a full university, and teaching is a big part of what we do. Um, and um, as inquisitive scientists, um, that means we also examine our own assumptions and ground our practices uh, uh, in evidence, both in terms of research and in teaching. Um, after all, to know how to teach science, you need to know how to teach in the first place, and the best teachers understand how their students learn. You might be surprised how long it can take professors to develop some of our most popular courses. There is a lot of research and evaluation that goes on under the hood. Tonight, we'll hear from uh, three professors uh, who are partially, at least, um, recognized for their outstanding teaching skills. Um, even if you're not a teacher by trade, you may find ways to apply their approaches and insights into your own life, uh, whether with coworkers, children, or yourself. Uh, once we're underway, uh, I hope you will post your questions for any of the speakers in the chat box, and we'll answer as many of them as we can. Uh, so with that, let me introduce our moderator for this evening. Uh, she is the Executive Dean of the College in Letters of Science of the College of Letters and Science, Jennifer Johnson Hanks. As Executive Dean, uh, she's responsible for advancing the mission and vision of the college and uh, for leading the Undergraduate Studies Division, where she bolsters Berkeley's commitment to elevating diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the undergraduate experience. Uh, Dean Johnson Hanks is also a professor of demography and sociology with interests in fertility and family, epistemology, and the history of population thought. Before teaching at UC Berkeley, uh, she was herself a student here in LNS. And after obtaining her undergraduate degree in anthropology, she then went on uh, to study at Northwestern University, where she earned her MA and PhD in anthropology. Uh, so again, we're delighted to have you here this evening. And um, please take it away, Jenna. Thank you, Dean Khan, uh, and welcome, friends. I'm Jenna Johnson Hanks, and I'm just delighted and very grateful to get to welcome you here to where we bring faculty from across the divisions of mathematical and physical sciences and the biological sciences to share their insights and research. These events are great opportunities for us to come together to talk about questions that matter, big questions, interesting questions, meaty, difficult questions. And that really is the joy and privilege of being part of the college's, College of Letters and Science that we reach across uh, the biological sciences, math and physical sciences, arts and humanities and social sciences in a way that really lets us think about the structure of our world, the structure of our societies, the structure of DNA and the universe and, and everything that matters here jointly in conversation. We are the liberal arts core of our great public university and it is my pleasure to get to elevate our dual missions of fundamental research and educating students for lives of consequence. Tonight, uh, we have invited three distinguished teaching award winners to discuss the science of teaching and what it takes to engage our students in scientific inquiry. The spark of that ignites a student's curiosity for science and mathematics. Uh, the spark that ignites a student's curiosity can happen anywhere, but it is crucially nurtured in the classroom and crucially by teachers such as we have today. At the end of each talk, uh, we'll try to address the questions that come from the audience. Please add questions into the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Our first uh, speaker today is the distinguished professor of astronomy, Alex Filipenko. Alex Filipenko is the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor in the Physical Sciences uh, at UC Berkeley. His accomplishments, which have been documented in more than 1,100 research papers, have been recognized by several major prizes, including a share of both the Gruber Cosmology Prize 
and the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. One of the world's most highly cited astronomers, uh, Professor Filipenko is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and an, and an elected member of the American Astronomical Society. Professor Filipenko is a recipient of UC Berkeley's two most coveted teaching awards, both the Distinguished Teaching Award and the Donald Sterling Noyce Prize for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. In 2006, he was named the, the Cass Carnegie National Professor of the Year. Tonight, he will share with us how he successfully engages students in his large lecture courses. Professor Filipenko, thank you so much for joining this evening. The floor is yours. Well, thanks so much for that kind introduction. Let me share my screen here so I can show you my slides. Can, can everyone see that? Yeah, looks great. great. Okay, well, uh, very good. Anyway, it's uh, really a pleasure to have been asked to be part of this distinguished group. I'm going to focus my remarks about teaching large introductory courses. And large lecture classes have recently been much maligned. They're said to be ineffective. And even small lecture classes have been criticized. So there's been a strong push to alternatives, flipped classrooms or interactive classrooms. And I'm not against those at all. Uh, but I disagree regarding the ineffectiveness, supposedly, of lecture classes. Lectures can be highly effective and efficient, and older folks like myself learn this way, so it can't be all that bad, right? So some of the advantages are that you can spread the knowledge to many people. Indeed, the more the merrier, especially if you can break the class up into small discussion sections with graduate student teaching assistants. And the amount of extra time for the professor is not that much greater because, you know, you have to put in the thought and, and effort into preparing the lectures to begin with, even for one student. Uh, the goal, well, the key to giving excellent lectures, of course, resides in a number of, of particular um, aspects. And first, you have to thoroughly know the material. You have to be well organized, well prepared. You have to be clear, but also interesting. And you have to have an engaging delivery to capture the student's attention, especially in classes for non-majors, you know, where they're just trying to satisfy some science requirement or some other requirement. In my case, with introductory astronomy, they're trying to satisfy their basic science requirement. So the number one thing is enthusiasm. You know, you need you need to know what you're talking about. You need to say the right things, but you have to show real passion for your subject. Otherwise, they're likely to lose interest. If they don't see you being passionate about your own subject material, why should they be interested in it, right? So you just, you, you know, you're a performer, make it fun. Um, T-shirts, music, jokes, fun things, personal stories, photos, animations, poems, whatever it takes to capture and maintain their attention, right? Now you might think these are just gimmicks, but you know, you are a performer. You've, you've got to get these students to be more interested in what you're saying than in X or Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or whatever they happen to be doing on their, on their phones. So here's one of the t-shirts I wear. You are here, Berkeley, California. I'm wearing a t-shirt right now, partly to capture your attention the Berkeley Astronomy Department. So some students come to lecture just to see what it is that I'll be wearing. And it's always something that has something to do with that day's material. I'll play music while they're entering. Again, uh, music that's relevant to that day's subject. Um, I tell a joke at the beginning. Here's the joke I start lecture one with. Have you heard about the restaurant on the moon? Great food, but no atmosphere. Kind of geeky, but they can then see my personality. If they don't like it, they're welcome to leave. The Doppler effect. Here's a bumper sticker. If this sticker is blue, then you are driving too fast. Again, I explain this in the relevant lecture. Fun facts. You can tell students something interesting while the students are arriving or spend the first couple of minutes of lecture telling them something interesting, like, why does the moon look big? when it's on the horizon. All of you have noticed this. You know, it's an interesting explanation. Indeed, we're not even completely sure of the full explanation. 
engage the students by including current news and recent research results, both the research of others or your own research, especially if it's relevant to that day's lecture. So I study the expanding universe and I tell them about dark energy and the accelerating expansion of the universe. And the students get really interested then in what I tell them during the lecture devoted to that topic. They love personal stories. One of my favorite personal stories is that when I was 14, my parents gave me a Christmas gift, a small telescope. And that night, the third random star that I looked at turned out to be Saturn. So I discovered Saturn on my own that night. It didn't matter that millions of people already knew about it. No one told me to point my telescope at that star and that it would be Saturn. And I realized then that if I could get such a thrill out of discovering something that everyone else already knows about, what a true privilege and thrill it must be to discover something that's completely new to humanity. And this reaffirmed not only my desire to become a scientist, but set me on the path toward astrophysics. I was on a path toward a professorship in chemistry, really, at that time. But uh, this set me on to physics and astrophysics. Photos, animations, videos, those are prevalent in astronomy. Here's one of the James Webb Space Telescope photos, which shows literally tens of thousands of galaxies in a portion of the sky no bigger than a small pebble held at arm's length. Wow, I mean, it's just fantastic. Um, gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time predicted by Einstein a century ago and discovered for the first time about seven or eight years ago. Um, analogies, the expanding universe, universe shown as an expanding loaf of raisin bread. The galaxies are the raisins, they don't expand, but the dough is uniformly filled with yeast and it expands and you can see that no particular raisin can claim to be the unique center and the more distant raisins move away faster than the nearby raisins because there's more dough between them than between you and the nearby ones. So, you know, it really helps illustrate for students the complex ideas that you're trying to present. I encourage questions and the number one rule is to never use a condescending tone toward a student. Even if they did ask a supposedly stupid question, you know, a, a, a question that is literally what I just said in, in plain English, but that's okay. They were texting someone or whatever, so it's all right. Try to learn some students' names, calling them by name. That's not so hard to do even in a giant class because some students religiously come to office hours and you can learn their names there. Demos, show demos if possible. They help elucidate concepts and students respond well. So, you know, many effective demos, you don't even need a lot of expensive equipment. Um, they can do them at home. And so here's an example, again, from the expanding universe. Here, a closed finite universe, an expanding balloon with the galaxies being stickers stuck on the balloon. Um, I encourage my students not to be scribes. So I produce a course reader containing the main content, not the pretty pictures, but the slides that contain equations or concepts or diagrams. And then I talk about those slides and students can write marginal notes, but they don't have to write down everything that I said because it's there. The students can listen to and try to absorb what I say. Again, they can take marginal notes if they want to. Peer instruction is something that's really great. It's been now around for a quarter of a century. You involve your students. You get them to participate and to teach each other. So I ask them a question. And then after a minute, they show their preferred answer with these think pair share cards or with a clicker. And then I look at the answers um, throughout the room. And if there's a large dispersion, I ask them to convince their nearest neighbor that their answer is correct. And I let them pair and share for a while, like a minute. And then I ask for a new set of responses. And here's a typical question, for example, why does the sun shine? In the interest of time, I won't go through the various um, 
answers, but it's nuclear reactions in the center release energy. And so then they show me their answers again. This engages the students and makes them think critically. So just to summarize, enthusiastic, well-organized, clear, entertaining, and interesting lectures, photos, videos, and animations, poems, music, t-shirts, jokes, personal stories, demos, models, anything to get and retain their attention, encourage questions, and most importantly, show real passion for your subject. Let it all hang out. Show your love of teaching and your subject on your shirt sleeve, and this might get and maintain the interest of a significant fraction of the students. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to entertain your questions. Wow, Dr. Uh, Mr. Pilipenko, that was fantastic. Uh, it's such a joy to, to hear you speak. It looks like we have some, um, some questions coming in in the chat, and I'm going to start with, could you tell us about a couple of your favorite demos that you use in class? Oh, yeah. Um, well, you know, there are so many, but one that I really like is when illustrating gravity, I actually twirl a donut around my head attached to a long string, and eventually the string eats its way through the donut and is no longer attached. So the force of gravity on the moon, right, the donut represents the moon, is cut off, and the students are supposed to notice that the donut goes zooming off uh, tangentially to its orbit um, at the moment that the force was cut off. So you no lo longer have the inward force. So it doesn't go spiraling out and doesn't go out radially. It goes off tangentially, you know. And then probably my favorite of, of all time is I discuss Hawking radiation, which is the uh, evaporation of black holes through a fairly abstract and complex quantum process. And then I tell them, okay, you know, so that you remember at least the gist of what I'm trying to say. I, by the way, I'm dressed up as a black hole. I kind of look like the Unabomber because I'm in this black outfit, but I have attached to me a bucket full of celestially themed candy, like eclipse gum and orbit gum and starburst candies and Mars bars and Milky Way bars. And I st start throwing them out to the audience. And I do this the day of Halloween or the day before, depending on which day of the week Halloween falls, because I teach Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you know. So students come back to me years later, and they say, you know what, I remember Hawking radiation and your demo of it. So between donuts and Mars bars, we've got students who are learning through sugar. I love it. That's fabulous. Yeah, there you go. Right. So I'm looking now in the chat and there's so many questions coming in. The first one is, or the next one is, do you give a lot of homework? Why or why not? Yeah, yeah, I, I give weekly homework and, you know, there are 11 homework assignments and then two weeks they do or they turn in their lab write-ups. Uh, and I uh, only count, so to speak, their top eight out of 11 homework scores because, you know, everyone has a bad week or maybe they have five other midterms that week or whatever. And so I give that homework because it, it helps them understand the material and the exams are necessarily multiple choice and true false in a course with 850 students. So it's machine graded. So I want them to have a chance to, you know, write down some of their thoughts and show some problem solving skills. You know, the, the whole point of the course is not to make them, you know, engineers or mathematicians or something, but Astronomy is a physical science, and I would be cheating them as Berkeley students if I didn't include some of the math and physics and physical reasoning. So, um, yeah, I, I think the homework is an important part. It counts for some course points, but not a lot. If it were a lot of course points, then they would just copy off of each other. If it were too few, they wouldn't do it. So I try to find a happy medium. Yeah, that's great. Um, do you practice your lectures and how do you practice? Well, you know, over the years, um, they've changed gradually with time. I never gave give the same le lecture twice because I don't want to get bored. But honestly, now I've taught that introductory course once a year for 37 years. And so I don't really have to practice my questions much. In the half hour before class, however, I look through my notes, I look through the slides, 
I rehearse what it is I'm going to say conceptually, but I don't have my lecture written out. I just know the order in which the slides are going to come and the main points that I want to discuss and how I'm going to discuss them. Oh, you're you're very brave. <laughs> <laughs> Faculty often say that they learn from their students. And I think this is going to have to be our last question. Sure. Do you learn from your students and even in the introductory courses? Sure, sure. Because um you know, they'll they'll ask questions, if not during lecture, then during office hours. And there I encourage deeper discussions beyond what I sort of want them to really know as a result of the lecture, right? So there I find that if I'm not able to explain something in a relatively simple, understandable matter, manner, more often than not, it means that I myself don't understand it as well as I would like to. So then I go off and, you know, try to understand it better. And sometimes this can even inform my research because in trying to come up with a better explanation that students can understand, I'll realize that, oh, gee, this or that aspect of the phenomenon is actually not understood even by professionals in my field. And that can then open up new avenues for research. Wonderful, thank you so much. There are more questions, but we need to move on now. So thank you so much. I will stop sharing um, my screen or maybe you've already done that. So yep. yeah. We now get to move on to our next speaker for the evening, Assistant Teaching Professor of Mathematics, Alexander Pollan. Professor Pollan is a, um, focuses his research on improving mathematics instruction across the university. He has taught large lower division mathematics courses for, for the past 10 years and was awarded the university's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2020. More recently, he was awarded the university's Extraordinary Teaching and Extraordinary Times Award for his joint work developing an online summer program to better prepare incoming STEM students. I've also had the privilege to, to work with Professor Pollan as he is figuring out how to address the, the, um, the large and growing challenges of students uh, coming into mathematics after COVID and how, um, and how we can serve them and prepare them to go on to uh, successful careers in mathematics uh, despite the, the challenges that they faced in, in their high school preparation. Professor Pollan is widely recognized as one of the most outstanding mathematics professors at Cal, leaving many curious about the key factors that have contributed to his exceptional teaching style. So tonight we will have the privilege of hearing from him directly, delving into the secrets behind his acclaimed teaching tech methodology. Professor Pollan. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I just want to say it's a great uh, honor to be here to talk to you all today. So let me share my share my screen. So um, I'm going to talk about kind of the experience of learning mathematics at university and kind of my approach to teaching mathematics as well as kind of why it's important. But just to give a little bit of a background, I first came to Berkeley um, back in 2008 as a postdoc and I was completely focused on research. I don't think I'd ever done any teaching before, not in my PhD back in the UK. And um, it was a great experience coming to Berkeley. It's where I really cut my teeth, but teaching much smaller classes. And by the time it got to 2014, I kind of switched across to kind of really just focusing on teaching away from research. And that's when I started, I suppose, 10 years ago, um, teaching very large, large lower division classes. So let me talk kind of broadly to begin with about mathematics at Berkeley, right? So STEM majors, as we all know, I mean, they use mathematics in a very sophisticated way, generally speaking, far beyond the level of high school. If you were to look at the majors that we offer, something like 40 of all the majors require our lower division mathematics classes as prerequisites. So the classes I teach, I mean, are enormous. So I, for example, am teaching Math 1A, the introductory calculus class, next fall and it's going to be 1600 plus people right so in an absolutely colossal class most of these are going to be first years who are kind of coming to university for the first time and it's going to really be their first experience really learning anything at university um the incoming class i mean 1600 people it's going to be incredibly diverse a lot of the students coming in will be very well prepared they'll have been to very good high schools and they will be 
in some senses, more than prepared. They might be able to skip out of Math 1A, but they want to take it because it's their first kind of semester. At the same time, there are a lot of students who are really drastically unprepared. And this has been the case for a long time. I think it's been exacerbated by the pandemic, as I may talk about a bit later on. But I would say about 30% of our students coming to these classes have very limited foundational knowledge to the point that in the first week where I'm going through just a, a, a recall of the basic concepts that I assume everyone knows, plenty of them have never seen these at all. So the basic algebra of exponents, logarithms, and trigonometry, some students have basically not seen that at all. So that obviously contributes to a lot of anxiety for many students coming into these classes. I mean, learning mathematics is difficult for literally everybody. It doesn't matter how great you think you are at mathematics. It's hard to learn it. And a lot of people kind of are scared coming to these classes. I mean, all of us probably have a preconceived notion of what kind of a, a big mathematics lecture is like at university. And I mean, to me, it's something like this, right? This is the picture I have in my mind of kind of you walk into a big math class, you don't understand anything on the board, and it's just terrifying. So part of my job is to make sure this is not the truth, right? This is not what we want people to feel their experience of learning mathematics at university is like. So one of the big challenges that students face is this kind of this leap from high school to university. The most obvious thing is conceptually mathematics just really ramps up, right? Even in subjects that may have seen in high school, suddenly topics like calculus, derivatives and integrals are done in a much more sophisticated way because they need to use it in a more sophisticated way, right? At high school, it's very kind of by the numbers. Here are very specific problems, same thing over and over again, but you're not using these things to solve difficult problems. At university, we're teaching them mathematics because they need to be really skilled at it to excel in their STEM majors, certainly in things like physics, engineering, and lots of other subjects like data science as well. It's a much faster pace at university. Every single lecture is something new, whereas at high school, you can spend weeks on one concept. Applications, examples, computations, just much more detailed, much greater depth, much more varied. And it's really independent. I mean, a lot of students are very used to having their hands held through the learning experience. And suddenly they get to Berkeley or any other university and they don't have that. And it's a big shock and it's, it's difficult for them to adjust to learn really what it means to be a university student. So I don't think there's any one way to teach anything effectively, really. We all bring our own personalities to teaching, but let me just share a few kind of specific things about how I teach. So I think with mathematics, so you don't need to look at the details here. It's just to give you a sense of what I show students in lectures. But I think it's mathematics, it's kind of very dense notation. It can be very difficult to kind of follow kind of a linear thread of logic. And a lot of people, when they're writing mathematics down, they're not including all the details. I think it's really important when you're learning mathematics that every possible detail, every kind of moment to moment kind of thought is as clearly laid out as possible. So you can see here, this is me doing something called an integral. In the black is the computation, but I'm highlighting at every stage actually kind of what the key insight is that allows you to transform or simplify. And I do this with literally everything in the class in handwritten format. Because so many students, if they lose the thread for a second, they disengage from the lecture. You don't want that to happen. You want them to be able to concentrate without kind of losing the thread because then they just stop paying attention. And in a mathematics class, you've really got to concentrate. Um, another thing is, I mean, a lot of students, especially ones who are nervous about mathematics, feel that there's something kind of magic they're missing, like some sort of like divine inspiration that certain people are able to get about mathematics by looking in the sky. And yes, yeah, sure, sometimes like lightning might strike your head and you realize something amazing, like a eureka moment. But honestly, what's more important is learning methodical problem solving, right? Here's a specific type of problem. How do you solve it in a completely methodical, systematic way? That skill, honestly, is the most important thing to learn, certainly in lower division mathematics classes, because it's universal, right? The idea of taking 
what's in your toolkit, things that you know, how do you put them together in a completely rigid, methodical way to solve a difficult problem? It doesn't need to be mathematics, it can be anything. But mathematics is a great kind of place to hone this skill in isolation of lots of kind of other external factors. Another thing I think super important in these big classes, we talked about how diverse how diverse the, the student body is. It's really important, certainly for me, to be able to put my shoes and put my, put my myself in the shoes of my students. Because, I mean, it's so many different perspectives. When I explain something, it makes a difference who I'm talking to, right? Uh, if I'm talking to someone who has very limited background in the basics, I will slow down the exposition, make sure I can go through every detail super carefully. I'm talking to somebody who knows a lot, a lot more of the foundational material, I may be talking a different way. There is a middle ground, though, where you can have hit everything, as I talked about before, while still talking about more interesting topics as you kind of go through it. I also think you've got to have a lot of empathy, right? You've got to remember what it means not to know the material. I think that's kind of crucial for all instructors. You've got to be able to reach back in time and think, goodness, what was it like when I didn't know this? What was I thinking when I was seeing it for the first time? And when you've got that perspective, when you get asked questions, you suddenly remember, like, oh, goodness, yeah, I thought that as well. And I often try and tell my students when I'm explaining stuff how I was confused when I was first seeing topics. But another thing is, I know this is a very mathematics looking slide, mathematics can feel just like this endless sea of just weird dry notation. It's not, right? There's tons of beautiful visual ideas in it. And sometimes just a picture is much more illuminating than just some sort of formal mathematical argument. So I always try and justify things visually. For example, when I teach something called linear algebra, which is a very kind of foundational mathematical subject in lots of different STEM disciplines, I really focus on the visual. I always want to keep the class active, engaged. So, I mean, in a big lecture room, that can be a bit intimidating. It took me years to get kind of comfortable doing it, but literally just walking around the room, talking to students when you give them a question, right? Making it kind of just like a kind of a, a much smaller classroom or continuously asking questions about certain, certain computations I've done, saying, why did I do this? Can anyone tell me? Or are there any questions about like, how could we change this? So just always asking questions and kind of stopping to give the chance a class to kind of get your feedback. Another thing about these early math classes is they can feel very disconnected from students' interests, like learning how to do derivatives, integrals. It can just feel very like just abstract and dry. So I always try and connect it to students' interests. So here I've got kind of two examples of what I do. One is on kind of CT scans and how they're related to calculus. Another one is on something called a neural network, which is I mean, how AI is working, basically, and how it's related to linear algebra. So I always try to bring it back or to connect the dots between what's happening in class and students' broader interests. I think a lot of learning happens outside the classroom, though, right? So I can get up and kind of give what I think is an amazing lecture, but really it's when they go away and really think about it on their own or kind of in, in small groups, that's where lots of kind of the major connections are made in their mind about how things work. So I record videos for everything, um, make sure they're accessible to everybody, where I really just go through the same material as I go through in lectures. I give worksheets to students who in kind of smaller graduate student led discussion groups, they go through them in groups. So it's kind of a much smaller collaborative learning experience. But I think everyone learns a little bit differently, right? So different, different ways of engaging the material are really important. Another thing kind of I've talked about is lots of students are coming into university with really drastic holes in their foundational knowledge, like drastic. And over the last few years, I've kind of worked to develop kind of courses, interventions, which allow students to kind of address those foundational issues while still being able to engage in our, our classes. So for example, I developed recently a course called Pre-Calculus Essentials. Um, and it basically is an intervention that students can, can take during a semester where they can take this kind of short pre-calculus class in parallel with, for example, Math 1A. So they've got real-time support in the topics that they're seeing in these other classes. So it gives students a way to kind of address these holes in their knowledge 
in a kind of a robust way that we are, we know. I mean, a lot of students will turn to the Khan Academy when they're struggling. There's often not enough detail. That's the problem. They need really detailed understanding of things. And that's what these kind of resources were when we designed them. Finally, as Professor Filipenko said, I think it's crucial to just give off how much you love your subject. And mathematics has always been something I found absolutely astounding, amazing, right? And I always try and explain to students or convey to students when something I think is incredible happens, I'll tell them, right? So this is a picture of a fractal. I gave a lecture on this the other day, the very end of the course, it wasn't technically on the syllabus, but I wanted to show them this, to show them that these simple ideas they'd seen all the way through calculus two, perhaps not the most thrilling course could be put together to do something completely incredible. So yeah, that's my approach to teaching. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Paul, and that was just enchanting. And yes, mathematics is amazing. Um, we have in the, the chat already some questions coming in. Do you take, uh, how do you deal with questions during lecture? Do you hear them? Do you take them during the lecture in office hours? Uh, how do students contact you to get more information? So in lectures, so in lectures, so for example, that, that slide I had where it was just that very dry looking computation with lots of kind of red arrows. In lectures, basically, every time I kind of do anything, I turn to the audience and say, okay, does anyone have any questions? And I leave it a painful amount of time because there's always a lot of people in lecture who don't, who are not following or are struggling and are too nervous to ask. And at the beginning of the class, especially, it, it can be painful. I'll stand this and any questions, literally anything at all, anything, 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 anything. And like maybe 20 seconds go by, it starts to get awkward and someone breaks, someone can't handle the silence and they'll ask a question. And it may be a very, very elementary question. It may be a classic misconception or it may just demonstrate that I've explained it poorly, but then the floodgates kind of open and suddenly lots of other people start talking. And as the semester goes along, it, that process becomes a bit less painful, right? It doesn't take 20 seconds of silence. So I really am just continuously turning to the audience to ask them how they're thinking about it as much as possible. I mean, when you have a lot of material to get through, you can't do that the whole time, right? But you should, I certainly feel that when things are really critical in a computation and it, it's all for nothing if they don't understand what's happened you should slow it down as much as you possibly can yeah thank you that's great um do you have any specific professors who were role models for you or that you think too as a moment when you when your uh, mathematical education was transformed good question I think I've had a lot of very wonderful teachers. Um, it, for me, I was very lucky at university and that a lot of the, 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 the most effective learning I did was with the group of friends I made um, as an undergraduate. I was incredibly lucky to just fall in with a group of people who had a very similar attitude about mathematics to me. We're all math majors and we kind of fed, our enthusiasm fed off each other. And I did have plenty of great lectures but I, I felt quite disconnected from them, largely because I think the style in which the university did things was different than at Berkeley. I was at Cambridge in the UK, it was a bit more formal. But I did learn some stuff, not from the good teachers, from the bad teachers. So I had a variety of, I think, catastrophically bad teachers, perhaps. And they did things which were just so awful that they've always stuck with me. And occasionally, if I think I've done something bad, I think, was it that bad? Goodness, I hope not. But I mean, yeah, so it's funny, it's some of the worst lecturers that have taught me the most about what you shouldn't do as a teacher. But honestly, I learned the most teaching or learning from my other, my other friends. And they were teachers to me because they would basically learn it themselves and then sit down and try and explain it to me. So yeah. Thank you, that's wonderful. I wish we could keep going. We, we, we have the exciting pleasure to move on, but I, I look forward to coming back to, to hear more. Um, we uh now get to move on to our final speaker of the evening, uh, Professor Marla Feller. Marla Feller is the Paul Licht Distinguished Professor in the Biological Sciences, and her research specialties are in neuroscience and the neural circuits of the retina. Professor Peller, Feller is appointed both in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology and also in the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. 
She's published hundreds of papers, including in the journals Neuron, Science, and Nature. And a, a simple rule is that the shorter the name of the journal, the more important. Professor Feller is a UC Berkeley alumna. Uh, that was not true, but in this particular case, it's true. Uh, Professor Feller is a UC Berkeley alumna and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. She is acclaimed both as a teacher and a scholar, and has a remarkable record of service to the college and to the university. And more remarkably, she connects together her research and teaching, taking students where they are and offering them through research an enchanting pathway into where they want to be. Over to you, Professor Feller. Thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Uh-oh, here we are. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for this um, opportunity uh, to speak to you today about something that actually is quite an, important uh, to me and motivates me every day in my job. And that is, sorry, teaching students to find their inner scientist. And I want to apologize ahead of time. I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. So, uh, so I apologize for that. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay, so teaching students to, to be their inner scientists. Um, so I wanted to actually start with my educational journey and how I became a scientist. And that mostly happened here at, um, at Berkeley. I got my undergraduate degree in physics here. Um, I transferred from UCLA to Berkeley as a junior. I stayed here to get my PhD in experimental physics. Um, and, I, uh, and then I made a transition. So after I got my PhD, I, I I started a postdoctoral research position at Bell Laboratories, where I started working with a group of physicists who were developing methods used by neurobiologists. And so then I came back to Berkeley um, as a as a uh, for my second postdoctoral fellowship, where I was I uh, had the pleasure of being a, a, a fellow in the Miller Institute for Basic Research. Um, and then my first job, I left Berkeley. I went to the NIH as an independent investigator. I was an assistant professor at UCSD. And of course, I came back to Berkeley um, about 15 or 16 years ago, where I, I plan on spending the rest of my career. OK, so that's my history um, sort of as a student. But I, I want to talk to you now as my role as an instructor. So I also teach undergraduates. I thought I taught the, some of the largest lecture courses around, but apparently not. <laughs> I taught Bio 1A, um, uh, uh, for, which I'm sure many of you took as a student. Um, I teach the Introduction to Cellular Neurobiology for the Molecular and Cell Biology Department. Um, and most recently, I've actually been teaching a senior lab course, which has really been a fantastic experience because this is when our the, these these are our seniors um, who are, are who are neurobiology majors, and this is often their first opportunity to actually put their hands on neural tissue and to take real measurements, um, and they just absolutely love it, and they get to sort of find their inner scientist um, at, at this opportunity. And then I also mentor undergraduates in my lab. Um, I actually wanted to just take a moment to say that, you know, I think uh, um, that being an active researcher that I am, that I can bring a lot to teaching because active researchers can sort of help make decisions about what are the most interesting things uh, to teach in the vast world, the ever-changing world of biology. Um, but it's actually really helpful for my own research to teach undergraduates. They ask interesting questions, but they also give us a chance to reflect on sort of our own choices that we're making for our research and to make sure we're not going down some little rabbit hole and that we're continuing to work on really kind of basic things that we want to teach our undergraduates about. So there's tremendous value in that. And I wrote an article about that um, a few years ago that's shown here. Um, so I also teach graduate students. I teach a cellular neuroscience course for first year students interested in neurobiology. I teach the principles of imaging using microscopy, modern microscopy methods. This is a slide from one of my lectures on the right. Um, and, and then uh, for graduate students, we teach hot topics courses so they kind of know what are the latest things people are doing research on. But what I'd really like to uh, sort of talk about um, now is actually the mentoring excuse me, that I do for my, my students. So I mentor PhD students, undergraduates and PhD students in my own lab. 
since running my own lab, I've actually mentored over 40 students. And I wanted to sort of spend some time about what that feels like as a, as a, as a, as a teacher of scientists. So in order to do that, I just have to give you a very brief introduction to the research that I do as it reflects on, on the way that I train scientists. So my area of research is called neurodevelopment and, the, and it's the challenge of how the brain gets wired up during development. So the brain is made up of a lot of cells that are called neurons. So there's 10 to the 11 of these neurons um, in your brain. And those, and those neurons have to make connections to other neurons. In fact, they make connections to about 100 different neurons and they get input from 100 different neurons. And in order for your brain to serve its function of processing sensory inputs and um, generating the behaviors and thoughts um, uh, for, our, for our way of interacting with the world, those neurons have to be connected together. And so the question is, how does that happen during development? And the way that my lab studies this is by focusing on a part of the brain that's devoted to vision. And, um, and what I'm showing you here is the development of, hum of uh, the human brain um, uh, embryonically, um, so during fetal development. So uh, the part of the visual system we study, that means the retina, which is that little piece of the brain that's at the back of your eye, it has to get connected up to the brain uh, to sort of interpret those visual signals that the retina is encoding. And that wiring happens at a, an incredibly early period in, uh, um, in gestation. And so the kind of classic model of thinking about how the brain gets wired up is that everything that happens before a baby's born is somehow um, genetically part of a genetic loop blueprint. But it turns out that actually neural activity plays an important role um, during this process. And so then the question is for the visual system, there's clearly no vision going on what generates this activity. And it turns out that your developing retina is spontaneously active. So what you're looking at on the left here is a movie of a retina that's been isolated from a mouse at this early stage of development, soaked in a dye that looks at neural activity. And you're looking at these spontaneous test patterns that are being generated by the retina that are propagating up through the nervous system. So when a student wants to learn to be a scientist in my lab, they're gonna ask research questions. How are these waves generated? Um, uh, how do you, uh, how do you, why do they stop when vision matures? What role do these waves play in setting up the retina and the retina's connections to the brain? And these have a broader context. This sort of activity is seen throughout the developing nervous system and has a lot of implications for human development. So my students love waves. Here are my students doing the waves. So everybody, they love waves and they want to do research. And so I thought to sort of understand how a student sort of gets uh, involved in doing research like this, I would sort of just take you through the timeline of what, our, what a, a graduate student goes through. So in, in year one, students take classes. They rotate in different labs. These are two students who rotated in my lab. Christiane on the right joined my lab. Laura on the left did not. Um, and then they, and, and so by the end of their first year, they've picked a research topic. In their second year, they actually work as graduate student instructors for our undergraduate classes. I often work with them on that. And then they take a qualifying exam where they sort of demonstrate a mastery of their field. And here we are celebrating one of my students passing her qualifying exam. And then year three is when the, the when, you know, my work really kicks in to helping them to become scientists. Um, they have to learn how to do research. So in my lab, that means first learning to run their equipment. We have a lot of home-built microscopes and stuff, and people have to be very comfortable with using those. Um, they have to learn how to analyze their data um, in a rigorous way using correct statistical tests. Um, they have to, um, they learn to communicate the science either by writing papers for publication or uh, presenting at conferences. And I think the biggest challenge that we have for teaching them is for them to develop their own um, scientific intuition, right? They have to know how to pick interesting scientific questions. And I think most importantly, they have to have the confidence to um, uh, know that they can actually do those experiments um, once they've selected them. And that, those are really my goals. And I sort of want to give, and, and I guess what I'd like to say is that um, everybody can get there. So these are, this is a, a more of the students that I've trained in my lab, but I just wanted to sort of illustrate it by these two students that are in the bottom right here. So um, the, the woman on the left in the sunglasses, that's Lowry. Lowry came from an academic family. Um, her father was a professor, a physics professor in Switzerland. Um, and she came to Berkeley actually to learn, she herself was trained as a physicist, but wanted to learn biology. And so she was 
you know, understood academia, was very new to biology. And she collaborated with another graduate student, David Arroyo, who's on the right. David um, is from Puerto Rico, family of 11. Everyone in his family had become mechanics. But David, uh, and that was what his sort of plan A was, but he took a biology class and through this amazing journey, sort of ended up in our molecular and cell biology PhD program. And so he was uh, uh, new, very new to academia, but um, sorry, but not new to, uh, but not new to biology. And together, they did a really nice study where they studied these retinal waves and they made a basic discovery about a particular class of cells that were involved in these waves that really sort of took my lab in a new direction. And I just think that's a beautiful example on how no matter what your background is, you need the training in order to get there to, doing, uh, to do science. And they're both um, pursuing careers in industry right now, um, uh, doing uh, scientific research in industry. Okay, so these are my students today. Uh, I have um, four graduate students at different stages of their training that are at the top. I have a couple of postdoctoral researchers that are in the middle. And um, the rest of these people here, five other people are actually undergraduates who are doing research um, in the lab. And they're all highlighted here. And I also wanted to you know, point out that the alumni from my lab, some do go on to academic positions. Anna Vlasitz was a graduate from the program, just started her own lab at Northwestern. Um, and other various research positions, and people also go into industry. And no matter, and actually, Christiane went on to a really interesting fellowship in the World Bank. So, no matter sort of what their goals are, their training is the same. And 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 I think that that is kind of like uh, the, I guess the thing I wanted to say is that when we think about our teaching mission here, that um, that uh, in addition to the classroom, we're training the um, the scientists of the future. So, thank you. Thank you so much for that really wonderful uh, enchanting <laughs> overview. Could you talk for just a moment? And I think we're only going to have time for for one question here. Um, Sorry about could that. you talk? It's, it's great. All of it was wonderful. Could you just talk briefly about what do you see as the greatest challenges that students face uh, making this transition to being independent scientists? Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge is confidence. I'm sure you've all heard about imposter syndrome. It is uh, it is rampant amongst the scientists. Again, whether the students come from academic families or whether they come from non-academic families, they have never viewed themselves as a scientist. They've always imagined that the scientists are thinking brilliant thoughts all the time, and that's not them. And so I think that I have to help them develop the confidence that they bring something unique to any question that they're working on. Um, and that and that's what it means to do science. That's great. We have just a bit of time left. And what I'd like to do then is to bring all of our speakers back for one, um, one question that everyone can speak to or, or address. And I, I, if, we have, if we can even to, to do so, maybe in, in conversation a little bit. Um, and I, I think the question I'm going to turn to is, is one from, from our audience, from Patricia in the audience, who asks, do you feel that your teaching has been changed with the increase in social media and online entertainment? Do your students have more challenge focusing or uh, have you innovated in ways that, that have related to those new technologies? Um, yeah, they're de they're definitely yeah. uh, more distracted with all of their devices and stuff, you know. And I know that you know some faculty don't allow devices in their rooms and stuff, but I think that's a little bit schoolmasterly and and difficult to enforce in a large lecture hall like in Wheeler Auditorium. So I just live with it, and that's one of the reasons I jump around and try to be engaging to be more interesting than what they have on TikTok or X or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. Well, I, I feel the same way. I mean, you, you can try and be draconian in a large class and say no phones, no laptops, but then some people are using laptops for legitimate reasons. Um, I do tell students if I see them with their phone out, they're in the firing line for questions. So if I see someone at the back, obviously not paying attention, the person at the back, can you tell me your name and can you answer this brutal math question? So it does make students like think twice about continuously sitting on their phones, but you can't really eradicate it totally. I, you know, I try to take a more positive 
attitude about it, particularly when I was teaching bio one a, I mean, we use it so much in our research that you can't be negative. I mean, social media is one thing, but the internet is a vast store of information. And, and for the, when I'm teaching the introductory classes, I want to help them figure out what is good information and what is not good information, right? Like, so they'll come up and say, oh, I found this, you know, if I, I don't know, eat yogurt, will I lose weight or something? And then I, you know, they'll have some sort of physiology. That's what I taught in Bio1A question. And I have, and I try to work with them. I do this a lot in office hours to, to process what is reliable information, what's not reliable information. And I think that that's something that um, we can try to do uh, um, with as, as teachers. Speaking of unreliable information, something I have noticed is um, that certain students will, even in mathematics, turn to things like chat GPT to try to solve their um, solutions. And I gave I gave a project on something called neural networks, which is the mathematics behind chat GPT. And they were using chat GPT to try to do that. I was trying to say that's that's cannibalistic horror. Not only that, chat gpt just can't do it right so they would submit answers which were obviously completely wildly not related but i think a lot of students don't quite understand what this technology is really and what it can do and certainly what it can't do so that's kind of something i've noticed recently yeah and on that topic um for the first time in four years I've switched back to in-person, in-class Scantron exams. I mean, during the pandemic, we had to do these online and then there are certain benefits. You know, students get their scores right away. We don't have to feed forms through a machine. There aren't the transcription errors and so on and so forth. But now it's so easy for them to cut and paste the digital material and they get an answer, you know, they get an answer instantaneously and at least for the types of questions that are typically asked in an introductory astronomy class, those answers are typically correct. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, yeah, it's definitely changed how I do my exams. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things we've done for that is we'll say, you know, I put this question into ChatGPT, a true false question. ChatGPT said it was false. Was it correct or not correct? <laughs> so we try to like you know make jokes about it but yeah anyway it's it is kind of a nightmare so yes well, i'm also back to in all in-person exams yeah yeah so i think we've got just uh, this is going to be like a very quick one or two an word answer um did you always want to teach i never wanted to teach I would okay. <laughs> and how did you fall in love with it well, so I, I uh, was given a chance to teach uh, twice as an undergraduate. I taught a seminar on astronomy to just a few students, and I found that to be um, a very positive experience, very rewarding. And then uh, during the summers in college, I was a tour guide at the University of California's Lick Observatory, and I would show people around and tell them about the history of the, the great refractor and all that, and that too was a rewarding experience. And then I started giving public lectures. And so all those experiences uh, made me want to teach. Yeah. I mean, my experience was, so I've got a lot of brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest, I think eight children. And I, I was notoriously impatient, certainly as a teenager. And whenever I, I, my mother said, could you help? Could you help like your sister with this? I would just fly into a rage when she couldn't understand. It was terrible. So I basically, there was this, stereotype in my family that I was incredibly impatient, terrible teacher. And I kind of thought that for a long time, totally focused on research, and maybe I'm a terrible teacher, I don't know. But at the end of the day, what happened was I sat down to, I don't know, synthesize something, an idea I'd had in my PhD, and I wanted to kind of write it down in a way that would make it understandable. And I kind of gave a talk on it, and I just had really enjoyed the process of taking this very complicated idea and making it understandable to someone who didn't know the background. And that, that made me think, wow, I actually like explaining it maybe more than a lot of other things so that's the first time I realized maybe I wanted to kind of make teaching more of a focus for me I think unfortunately we have to call it there thank you you were all spectacular um and I'm going to close I'm going to hand the floor to uh to Mike Botchen who is our dean of biological sciences
Well, thank you, Dean Johnson Hanks, uh, for moderating, and thanks to all our speakers for uh, their compelling presentation. It really could have gone on for another couple of hours, as far as I'm concerned. I've actually been fortunate to know many dynamic people, and what they often share is a lifelong desire to continue learning and growing uh, throughout the decades of their life. The pursuit of new knowledge enriches our lives, and I'm grateful for all of our faculty members who are making the, that process as enjoyable and efficient and rewarding as possible for our students. I hope that you all, our guests here, join us on May 14th for the next installation of Basic Science Lights the Way, where three biologists will discuss the intricacies of our species co-evolution with other beings. We hope to see you there. Please reach out if you would like to learn more about anything we covered. We will be sharing additional resources with you by email about today's topic and speakers of, of today's video will be available on Basic Science Lights the Way website. Approximately a week from now, you can always return to the Basic Science Lights the Way website to watch episodes you might have missed. Thank you for attending again and showing such interest in this topic. We couldn't do our work without you, without your attention and support. So until the next time, stay curious, keep learning, fiat lux, and go bears.